Hot boys, you guys can stand right up to the side, okay? Stay right here. Can I get a thing right? No, hold on. Hold on. One sec, right? <laughs> All right. What was that like after you break the record and your family's right there? Obviously, you go over to the show. Yeah. Can you just explain the emotion of that yeah. moment? You know, it, it's uh, it, it's hard for me to reflect too much right now, just because my career's not done. I, I, there, there are still goals to be accomplished. Um, there's still challenges to be met, and so I'm still very focused on that. Um, and yet, when something like this happens, and I can, you know, every, there's so many people that that are responsible for that that can be a part of that. It, it's it's. It makes me happy, you know, it makes me proud and it makes me extremely grateful, extremely grateful for the opportunity to play this game, to have played it as long as I've been able to play it, to have wound up here in New Orleans, which um, you all know that story. Um, so it, it's just been, it's been an unbelievable journey and I'm just so grateful. You know, the state of Texas, football is religion. Let's be honest about that. You grow up wanting to play for Westlake as a kid. You go to middle school, you're running the basics of the Westlake offense. And then you get your chance when you get to be a freshman. And, you know, once you're, once you're there and you're like, all right, I'm going to be that next guy. I'm going to be the guy who's going to take Westlake to their first state champion. And that was kind of the, the way it was going for myself. Uh, until I had a blew my knee out my sophomore year. And uh, from that, uh, I lost my spot to a guy named True Breeze. And uh, you know, I never got that spot back. I was born in Dallas, Texas. I moved to Austin when I was seven years old. And that was right at a time where my parents, parents were getting divorced. And so, you know, we lived in a lot of different places from age seven to 14. But at the end of the day, my mom, had done a ton of research on all the high schools um, in Austin and felt like Westlake High School w had the best all around academics and athletics. And she wanted that opportunity for you know, me and my brother. And so she moved into the Westlake High School district so that we would be able to go to high school there. You know, I moved to Westlake in eighth grade and so I was a bit late as well. I mean, Drew was too. Drew went to a private school and then kind of moved over for high school and so I think um, we were a little bit later to the scene there. There's really a Drew Brees story. As far as us, uh, we really didn't know anything about Drew Brees because he didn't go to the middle school at, at the Westlake District School District. And uh, when he came in as a freshman, his dad tells us the first scrimmage we had when he was a freshman, he didn't get in the scrimmage. <laughs> Chip, his dad, said he, he thought about talking to me about it, but he didn't. And, so anyway, that first year, Drew played on our freshman B team. Then the, the next year, he was going to play on our JV B team, and the starting quarterback in that class got hurt. As much as, you know, I wanted to be that guy, you know, Drew's a very good friend of mine, and I want him to be successful. And he stepped in, and watching him take the reins, whew, a little scary. And he had an aptitude to play quarterback, and we didn't pick it up until all these circumstances happened where we had to play him at quarterback. So I tore my ACL my junior year, the third round of the playoffs. I remember it like it was yesterday. We were undefeated. It was probably one of the best teams I've ever been a part of. We were going down to play in the third round of the playoffs, a team called Alice down in South Texas. It was a hostile environment. It was, it was a bootleg play, so I fake a handoff and I, and I go to my my right and I get hit and I come down and I, I feel my knee just, you know, it was kind of like slipped out of place and came back and I immediately knew that something wasn't right, especially as I began, you know, walked to the sideline and it was very unstable. And so when the doctor did the test and looked at me and said, you've torn your ACL, I mean, I was just completely devastated, just devastated, you know, not only just kind of the hopes and dreams of that season and, you know, that team feeling like, you know, we had an opportunity to state championship, but I had seen friends and other teammates have ACL injuries just like this and some had never come back the same you know it just for whatever reason you know it's a serious injury it was gut-wrenching when it happened 
because you just feel it, at that point it wasn't clear that he was going to have a very successful collegiate career or scholarship certainly not pros I mean as I'm sure it's well documented his kind of lack of attention to him in high school um, and so when you take when you have an injury like that and it's going to shelve you for a year I mean if said another way that's going to shelve you for 50 percent of your career if you're a junior and that happens and you miss your senior year I mean that that's the end of your sport, effectively. It's not a sprained ankle. Drew is the most competitive person you've ever met. And for somebody to tell him he couldn't do something and challenge him, uh, that's about the worst thing you can do is challenge Drew Brees. Because he will step up to the challenge and nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, he'll meet it. It was a defining moment for me in my athletic career. Because up until that point, I, I hadn't really faced that type of adversity before. You know, uh, uh, the type of adversity where you feel like something's really being taken away from you, you know, and that maybe you won't come back the same, you know. Um, and it scared me, it vote motivated me, it, it inspired me, it, it made me much stronger in my faith. Um, I really became a Christian at that time in my life. He's not going to brag about it, but I've always felt like he's real strong in his faith. and. And you know, we were talking in our Bible class, we all look back at our lives. Coaches, uh, we're all kind of retired, and we can see where things happen in our life that uh, we feel like God has something to do with it. And I've always felt that about Drew. I never talked to him about it, but I always felt that way. You know, you look back at your life and you know, why did, why did he tear his ACL? Would he be in the New Orleans Saints? or the leading passer without tearing at ACL? Or why didn't he play in that first scrimmage when he was a freshman? Was it something that humbled him, that put him, you know, made him work harder? I realized that maybe the things that I was worrying about were really very trivial. You know, it was really about, you know, what is my, what's more of my purpose, you know? And, and so I think I just learned a lot about myself during that time and certainly my faith being strengthened. And, just took it one day at a time and it was amazing I think the transformation not only physically but mentally psychologically um, that I went through over the next six months as I went through the rehab process and just you know I gained 25 pounds I became so much mentally tougher you know I had to overcome obstacles in rehab that I would never had to overcome before and you know there's a toughness element both mentally and physically that comes along with that and you know by the time the next season rolled around I was bigger, stronger, faster, but I was also so much mentally tougher and, and, and felt like not only was I going to come back, but I was going to come back stronger. You know, that was my mentality during that whole process. Watching them train and rehab from an injury is as inspiring as anything they'll ever do on a field. And that doesn't get as much press. And certainly in high school, you're not watching Drew rehab, but he busted his ass. And he busted his ass so he could get fully back, wanted his position back, wanted to lead the team. I know he had bigger ideas on what he could do after that, but it takes a lot of work. And it's hard to do that when you're not at 100%, when your leg feels like it weighs 100 pounds and you can't bend your knee. And, and the light at the end of the tunnel isn't two weeks on a sprained ankle, but it's, it's nine months. And then even then, you're uncertain when you plant on it if it's going to go again. So every time you take a step from there the rest of your life, you're potentially looking at a nine month hiatus. And I think it takes a special mind share to kind of, you gotta compartmentalize it. So he's clear to play football in August before his senior year. And uh, we were really concerned about it because of that knee injury. And, but he, that's when I saw him start to develop. We were playing in the San Antonio Churchill, we were playing the Alamo Dome in uh, one of our playoff games and Drew had steadily improved and we were making our receiver breaks at like 10 or 12 yards and so we moved them up to 20 where they'd make their breaks and he was whistling that ball out there. I mean, he was just exploding the ball 30, 40, 50 yards down the field. And so, you know, it was that point I, I just saw him develop. You know, the first playoff game was a little tough. We played San Antonio MacArthur. Uh, that was the closest game I think we played the entire year. And I think it was first game playoff jitters. Uh, you know, once we got through that, we started to roll and, uh, you know, Drew's shoulder caught fire. Our, you know, everybody was, was in sync. And before you know it, uh, we're in Dallas getting ready to play the state championship.
it was, I mean, it was, it was really magical. All the way to the state championship game where, you know, we're playing Abilene Cooper. Dominic Rhodes is the running back on the other side. He played in the NFL for a long time. The score was tied seven to seven at halftime. It was just one of these kind of gritty, tough games. And then, you know, we, we blew it open in the second half, got some turnovers, did some good things offensively and special teams and ended up winning 55 to 15, you know. So kind of went, won it running away, but just the, the journey. I mean, so much of that was just the journey. And again, I can reference every game and every guy on that team, just because that's, you know, for many people, that's, that's, that's kind of the end of it. You know, after high school, you know, not, not a lot of guys get the chance to go on and play beyond that. And so I think all of us had that mentality like this was, you know, this was the pinnacle. Every season you can write a book. I mean, there's so many, you know, you've got discipline problems you deal with, you got just, you name it, you have to deal with it. I can remember we were playing in the Alamo Dome. We had like three more games for the state championship. And Johnny Rogers was a part of this. After we won the game, the team was together and Rogers had organized them and they were chanting, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees. I mean that that was that was sort of an unbelievable deal, and you know when you when you saw that happening, and Drew didn't really do anything extraordinary for this to happen. I think that's the story of Drew Brees: his humility, his just being Drew Brees creates team unity, and this whole team is in there chanting Drew Brees, and you don't chant the guy's name if you don't like him. If they're ugly to you in the dressing room or whatever, or they bully you, you don't chant their name. And they were chanting his name, and that, that was just, that gave me the goosebumps when I heard that. Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, White Brees, Drew Brees, Drew Brees, White Brees. Hello, I'm Nate Baird, a communications student at Purdue University. I'd like to introduce you to a remarkable person. If you follow college football, you've probably heard this name. He's Drew Brees, who last year, as a 19-year-old true sophomore quarterback, shattered just about every Purdue and Big Ten single-season passing record on the books. Drew's always been a confident guy, sometimes too much so, because <laughs> he thinks he can complete every pass and actually throw the ball through the open linebacker. And that isn't true. But uh, certainly he's a guy that is very confident, and, and, uh, and that is really uh, a great quality to have in the sense that, uh, that if he does throw an interception or he does uh, make a mistake out there, he very quickly, uh, he's on to the next play mentally. That's a beautiful. Third down now for Breeze. And they were on him. Intercepted! Intercepted! Breeze can stop him! He does! He knocks him out of bounds! Breeze was the only defender who could knock Mike Doss out of bounds. A disaster for Purdue. The fourth interception of the game. So Purdue University, funny story. So I have the ACL injury my junior year of high school. I'm not recruited at all. So going into your senior year is kind of your time to go to the schools, go to the summer camps, get noticed. You know, where they get all the measurables. You know, the 40 time, how many times you can rip 225. And at all these camp camps, Drew's slower, okay? He's got a rocket for an arm, but he's not very mobile. Here I am, you know, listen, I'm a six foot quarterback. I play for a team that's a good team. It's a good program, you know. In many cases, it's the system, right? You know, or that was the perception. And you know, John Makovic at that time was the head coach at Texas. He caught a lot of flack for not, especially when we were deep in the playoffs, for not recruiting him. And John McVick said, well, I've already used up my quarterback allotment. Um, but we're winning games and, you know, we're accomplishing a lot as a team. And I remember at some point midway through the playoffs, I still had not received a single phone call from a school. Our senior year, Drew was the 5A state player of the year on the 5A state championship team. Now, what Drew did on the field speaks for himself. And any coach that missed that, you know, chances are they're probably not coaching anymore. Drew only really had two scholarship offers, full ride division one football scholarship offers. It was Kentucky and Wyoming. And the head coach of Wyoming decided to take the job at Purdue. In 1997, Purdue returned to the college football national stage. A journey back was the result of a relentless pursuit of victory. 
by a unique group of players and coaches. The journey's first step, however, was the hiring of Joe Tiller as Purdue's 33rd head football coach on November 22nd, 1996. When I come out to practice and we're getting ready for the state championship game, and I look on the sideline and there are two coaches. We had Coach Tiller from Purdue sitting on a bench on our sideline. Drew was so focused on the game, he didn't want to be, he didn't want to worry about that. I look at him and I look at Coach and I say, who are they here to see? He, and he looks at me and said, they're here to see you. I said, okay, well, Purdue, Ivy League, all right, that's good. I had no idea that Purdue was Big Ten. That says a lot for its academic reputation. Maybe it doesn't say a lot for its football reputation. But the more that I began to now learn about Purdue University is really what a strong heritage it has um, and tradition as it pertains to quarterbacks, you know, the cradle of quarterbacks. I was just glad that there were two schools recruiting him because it would have been a shame if he had not been recruited. Drew's always had uh, a way of landing on his feet. Uh, Joe Tiller getting the job at Purdue. He was bringing this high-flying spread offense to the Big Ten, which had never been done. And had found Drew and said, you're my guy. So there was a lot of confidence with that. You know, I mean, he was the first person who had really looked me in the eye and made me believe that I belonged there and that I could, I could be a part of something really unique there. Yeah, we have a very positive coaching staff and a very good coaching staff and an aggressive coaching staff and that if we could get our players to spend time around our coaches, we could affect their thinking in a very positive way. Joe Tiller got the job in December. He's trying to throw together a recruiting class in January, and then we're all signing in February. And You know, everybody always said we were Joe Tiller's babies. You know, we were his first recruiting class, and it was a small class. You know, we were ranked dead last in the Big Ten in recruiting classes, and there was only about 14 or 15 of us, you know, whereas most recruiting classes are 25 or 30. So we, we already had this edge. That's kind of something uh, to be proud of, considering his history at Purdue, uh, you know, being the most winningest coach at Purdue. And Drew was, of course, the quarterback that was supposed to come in and run Joe Tiller's uh, wide open offense. Well, first of all, I, I don't call Jason Jason, I call him Jay Bird. Jay Bird, gosh, Jay Bird was, it was never Jason, it was never just Lorzell. Drew always called me Jay Bird. Jason and I hit it off right away. Jay Bird actually started off at receiver. He came in as a slot receiver. And then he ended up transitioning to playing linebacker. We ended up you know, going to the dorm rooms to get our rooms. And we were two doors away from each other in the dorm rooms. We became roommates our second year. You know, We hit it off, became very good friends, uh, along with our other roommate, uh, Ben Smith, who came in as a quarterback and then transitioned to free safety. You know, we, were, we were thick as thieves. We were best friends and, and roommates for the rest of our time at Purdue. There were no regulations on you know, how many times you practice, how many times you practice in pads. And you really had to lean on each other uh, to, to get through. Basically, you know, we're in between practices, you know, we're trying to find a corner to sleep in to relax, and we're trying to eat the food that we need to eat to, to you know, still compete and not cramp. But you really, you really develop a bond um, with not just your teammates, but, you know, the, the, a lot of them turn into your brothers. You know what, we're coming in and we're underrated, but we're gonna show them what we're made of. And by the time we leave here, this class is going to lead this team to a Big Ten championship in a Rose Bowl. It was the kickoff classic against USC. It was one of the hottest games I think we've ever played. We finished that game at USC. Interestingly enough, uh, Coach Tiller boarded us up on, a, uh, on buses and we went over to the Rose Bowl, toured the Rose Bowl as sophomores to kind of get the fire started and burning inside of us. So when we came back, we had already been there, not to play a game, but we kind of knew what the end goal was. There were very high expectations because we had made that commitment to one another as a freshman recruiting class four years previous, that by the time we left here, we were gonna leave here as Big Ten champs. It didn't start off the way that we wanted. You know, we, we, we started off three and two, and we had lost two heartbreakers, one at Notre Dame, one at Penn State. I think really the low point in the season for myself was the Penn State game. And I remember sitting there, you know, it was kind of going into the month of October, staring at four ranked opponents consecutively. Here was the gauntlet. You know, if we were going to accomplish what we set out to accomplish, 
we were going to have to knock down each of these opponents. And it starts with Michigan. And here comes in Michigan, ranked fifth in the country. Look at their entire roster, and just about every one of them played in the NFL, you know? So they had beat us pretty soundly at their place the year before. But, you know, we felt like this was going to be different. And if we could, we could win this game, then this could be the catalyst to the rest of the season. Here's the staff, the placement, and the boot. It is up. It is good. Fans rush the field and it's just mayhem and I think that was that was a big turning point for us, a big defining moment for us during that season because we felt like, listen, we can hang with anybody. We can hang with anybody in the Big Ten and we can win this conference. And then it was Northwestern on the road, big win. Then it was Wisconsin on the road in overtime, big win. And it was coming back Ohio State. I love that game. Uh, we really played the whole 60 minutes. And every, I mean, the whole game was just action packed. Third down now for Breeze. And they were on him. Intercepted. Intercepted. Breeze can stop him. He does. He knocks him out of bounds. Breeze was the only defender who could knock Mike Doss out of bounds. I always believe, I've always believed in Drew, no matter what the circumstances are. I always, I always believe that he can put, bring us back. You know, I hate to use this, this, this saying, but fixing what he broke, you know, leading by example. Stuff like that that shows us the leadership and determination that you need to be successful. Second down and 10. Block to the left, block to the right. Cedric Brown stays at home alongside Drew Brees. Drew takes the snap from center. Look, that side to throw. Tears it out deep. Way down field. Go down. He's going to score. He's going to score. If you break it, you fix it. I broke it, but I think I fixed it. He allows everybody else to rise up to his level, or he brings everybody else up to his level. And there's very few players that can do that. I think he's one of them. There's very few quarterbacks that possess that ability. Who, who wouldn't want to coach Drew, who's a leader on the field, you know, a leader in the locker room. He's another coach on the field. You know, he's one of those that you can trust that when he leaves the locker room is going to make good decisions. There's a famous picture of Drew and Coach Tiller with Drew having his arm around Coach Tiller and it's up everywhere at Purdue. And, and that, was, that was the start of the celebration. Well, I don't think I'll ever forget the, uh, the sea of people on the field after the IU game. Something unique about the season I remember is we had our field rushed three times our senior year three times <laughs> where fans are on the field, jumping on goalposts, bringing them down, just because that was the level of emotion. I'll always remember uh, that crowd spilling onto the field and, and, uh, and the presentation of the trophy after the IU game. When that, the horn sounds to beat IU and they bring the, the bouquet of roses out on the field, I, I had this image in my mind when I was in high school of watching Charles Woodson for Michigan, take a rose and put it in his mouth. And I said, by the time I take, you know, walk off Purdue's field for the last time, when I walk out of Ross A Stadium, I want to have a rose in my mouth. And we were able to do that. The NFL draft process for me was kind of crazy. I was committed to get my degree. I still had, I think, about 15 hours left. So I was going to school in the mornings, and then I was coming in the afternoon, and I was training, training. and. So I went to the combine, didn't have a great showing at the combine. You know, I think I was so f focused on some of the physical elements, you know, all, all the things that I felt like they were doubting me. I felt like I had to prove something with my 40 time and some of the other things. And I really didn't throw the ball that well. Kind of kicked myself after. He didn't, he didn't have a really good combine, but he's a much more well-rounded athlete than he showed at the combine that year. So that didn't help him at all. I had followed Drew Brees as far as some guy up at Purdue putting up these amazing numbers as far as a quarterback. So you look at the numbers that he put up and then you say, okay, well, he's not quite as athletic as we think he is and he can't do this and he can't do that very well. And now all of a sudden you do look at him and say, okay, this might not be a guy who's real. Those numbers might not translate because he might be more of a system player than he is a great quarterback. He, he's not going to be a guy that's a 6'4", 6'5", um, tall quarterback. And you start looking at some of the numbers and it's like, man, that's impressive. But the first thing, your first impression is he, he's not going to be an NFL player. 
who cares about this other stuff, man? It's, it's, it's how you throw the ball, and, and, it's, and then it's just that personal contact you have with the coaches and who you are and what you stand for. And, you know, when you're watching the tape, your football knowledge, your, your, your football acumen, and, and just, um, you know, your leadership ability. From that time until the draft, which is about three weeks, you're just sitting there in limbo. You know, you have no idea what's going to happen. They began gathering outside the theater of Madison Square Garden before the sun came up. Fans of all teams trying to get in to watch Michael Vick, five other of the top players like LaDainian Tomlinson. The Chargers, I knew, had a big interest, but they were picking number one. So I really didn't think the Chargers were, I'm not, I know I'm not going to get drafted number one. And Yesterday afternoon, the San Diego Chargers and Atlanta Falcons swapped the number one pick of the draft. The headline is... The Atlanta Falcons have an opportunity to select Michael Vick. Michael Vick, Michael Vick, Michael Vick. He's the only guy you remember about that draft a lot. I mean, he was a phenomenon. You know, people were just enamored with Michael Vick. He had had a phenomenal game against Florida State in the Sugar Bowl down in New Orleans, and that kind of elevated him of how he would translate into the NFL. You figured if you're an NFL team, you can put some pieces around him and hopefully teach him to be a better pocket passer or just let him do what he does naturally and still that will be good enough for you. He was that good a prospect. With the uh, first selection in the 2001 NFL Draft, the Atlanta Falcons select Michael Vick, quarterback, Virginia Tech. I think the Chargers played it extremely well. They needed a quarterback, yes, and they probably figured we can get one later. They had to have LaDainian Tomlinson. With the uh, fifth pick, the San Diego Chargers select LaDainian Tomlinson, running back from TCU. Drew and I, both of us being from the state of Texas, we actually played in the same All-Star game. And we met there for the first time and we became big friends. Just before draft day, I remember Joe Tiller kind of pulling me aside and saying, hey, I've got a really good friend who's a scout for the Dolphins, and they are sitting at number 26, pick number 26 in the first round. And he says, if you're there, they are taking you. I realize at some point when all the other teams have chosen that, you know, Miami's the only one that's left. And so waiting for pick number 26, thinking it's going to be the Miami Dolphins. With a 26 selection, the Miami Dolphins have chosen defensive back from Wisconsin, Jamar Fletcher. I, I started looking at the teams after them in the first round, and all of them had quarterbacks. So, well, it's not going to be any of those teams. But at the time, you looked at it and said, okay, this is probably about where you would think Drew Brees might go. And then I see the first pick of the second round, and that is the San Diego Chargers. I think it's a perfect opportunity for San Diego to bring someone in young. We talked about Vic learning under Drew, Doug Flutie. Breeze can do the same thing. They had showed a ton of interest, and I felt like I had a great rapport with them. Norv Turner was the offensive coordinator. Mike Riley, the head coach, had, had some great visits with them, great meetings. They had come to my pro day and, and just seemed very, you know, interested. And then they were sitting there at the first pick of the second round. And With the first selection in the second round, number 32 overall, San Diego Chargers have selected quarterback from Purdue, Drew Brees. There's some Charger fans here in some JL jerseys, Tomlinson and Brees. And I had heard about Drew from my time in high school. I heard about this big time quarterback at Austin Westlake. And, um, we followed each other through college and, and went to some of the same banquets that you go to in college. And we actually spoke about being on the same NFL team when we were at one of those banquets our senior year. And ironically, it happened. It was, it was an amazing day for both of us to be drafted by the Chargers. And the most important thing is ending up in the right place with the right team, the right system, the right group of people where you can grow and mature and become the player that you know you aspire to be. And I felt like San Diego was the perfect place at that time for me. Um, Doug Flutie had been signed to be the starter, who was, you know, a huge childhood hero of mine. Watching him play, watching the Hail Mary when I was five years old, and just all of his accomplishments and just all that he had overcome. You know, he was a gritty. In my opinion, I think Doug Flutie is one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game at any level, because he played, he played at a high level at a ton of different levels, right? From college to USFL to CFL to NFL, you name it. And he's still one of my great friends, and I learned so much from him by playing with him. Not a more competitive person on this earth than Doug Flutie. Well, Drew was, was a great teammate. 
You know, he was very supportive of Doug Flutie. And he took the approach of, listen, I just want to learn as much as possible from a guy like Doug Flutie, who has been in the, the National Football League for, for a long time. I think it was a great thing for Drew, because Doug had just had so many experiences to talk about. You know, as plays were being maybe installed or talked about, Doug could reflect on his own experiences. And, and listen, Drew, he takes in every word, he hears it, and uh, you know, he's able to relate it to the game. So I get drafted 2001. Um, really to come in and back up Doug Flutie and, and, um, and be mentored by him. And the San Diego Chargers had been 1-15 in 15 the year before. So it was nothing but up from there, right? So we actually start off 5-2 two in 2001, and Doug is rolling, playing great. Doug gets a concussion in the next game. I end up playing a lot and play pretty well. Um, but, hey, I'm a rookie and made rookie mistakes and was just kind of, you know, flying by the seat of my pants out there. But... Um, we ended up losing nine consecutive games after that, so we, we finished five and 11. Marty Schottenheimer uh, came in and opened it up to a competition between Doug and I to be the starting quarterback for the 2002 season. I ended up winning that starting job, so I started, and we went eight and eight. We had one and 15 to five and 11 to eight and eight. Here we were going into the 2003 season with all kinds of expectations. Here we were, we had gotten a little bit better each and every year. Now we were poised to finally make that leap. We had a really tough season. We, we finished four and 12. I was benched three times during that season. Um, was benched for a five game stretch at one point, you know, for Doug. Man, you talk about tough, tough on the ego, tough on the confidence for me. You know, that had never happened to me before. I'd never been benched. Never even thought that that would, would ever be a possibility. And yet that's reality, you know, that's life. Not getting the job done, you know, you're, you're, you're not gonna play. So I learned a lot from that. You know, I, I learned a lot when I had to stand on the sideline and, 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 and watch it from that vantage point. But I learned so much, and when I stepped back out there, I, was, I felt like a different person and a different player. So that was, that, that was where I was now going into the 2004 season. The front office was looking at it as, Drew Brees may not be our guy, we need to go out and get another guy. And because we had finished so poorly with our record, we were drafting uh, we had the first pick in the draft. The uh, fourth pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the New York Giants select Phillip Rivers, quarterback, North Carolina State. Well, the result tells me there is a deal because Thank you. by taking Rivers, it tells you there is a significant trade here in the works between the Chargers and the New York. I knew it right away. I mean, prior to the draft, Cam Cameron, our offensive coordinator, pulled me in his office. Brian Schottenheimer, my quarterback coach, pulled me in his office. Marty Schottenheimer pulled me in his office. And they said, listen, we believe in you, but we're telling you right now, they're going to draft somebody or they're going to bring somebody in to compete with you, to take your job. I think Drew looked at the draft um, when they took Phillip as, as a challenge. He loves competition in anything. He loves competition. So when Phillip came in, you know, he was, he was the young guy there to take Drew's, Drew's role. And so Drew was like, it's, it's only going to make me better. And I wanted it to bring out the best of me. So I made the commitment to everything I possibly could to put me and my team in the best position to succeed. I ended up winning the job over Flutie and Rivers and being the starter. And, and we had, you know, one of those kind of storybook seasons from where we were. You know, we, we went from 4-12 and 12 to 12-4, and four, won the division, home playoff game, biggest turnaround in franchise history. The bottom line is this. We're the San Diego Chargers. And we are number one in the AFC West, and we're going to stay there. That growth from, you know, my first three years to that year and that moment was a huge pivotal point for, for, for me and my mindset in my career. On the blitz, ball knocked loose, standing on the goal line, and recovered, it looked like maybe by Brandon of the Broncos. John Lynch knocked it out. We were in a suite with his friends and in our family. And I think Drew Brees got hurt on that play, going for that fumble. You know, he went down. And I just knew that was it. We were gone. Well, that arm gets hyperextended in a very scary position. I thought to myself, you know, this is probably the last time that I ever put on a Charger uniform. And then reality really sinks in. I say, this might be the last time I ever put on a football uniform. He walked off the field. 
with his arm just locked up. And it was the strangest, strangest position, you know, of anyone that I've ever seen with an arm like that. I can remember specifically the injury happened and you know as a coach you're always kind of oh, I wonder how you know how bad is it and I can remember uh, being up in the press box and as he came off the sideline onto the sidelines I can remember Cam Cameron saying oh it's not good. Yeah, I was in disbelief like I just didn't believe that he was hurt that bad you know I you know we were very close and and like I said we worked out together and so to see him kind of holding his shoulder I just was thinking like Oh, you know, it's just a bad sprain. It's, it's not that bad, it'll be okay. I knew exactly what my injury was when I got up off the ground. Um, I could feel that basically my shoulder was out of place. It was a dislocated right throwing shoulder. I mean, if you could <laughs> rank the worst injuries that you could have as a quarterback, I mean, that's right up there. Well, I happened to be watching the game on TV and I saw uh, him get hurt and they showed it again on a replay, and I could tell that uh, he had, had, was diving for a ball down on his goal line. Then some lineman fell across his body and made his arm go away over his head, and he walked out with his right shoulder caught and he was, as he came off the sidelines. And having been there and watching that in slow motion and watching him walk off, uh, I knew that he had uh, knocked his, his Humeral head out the socket inferiorly, which is down to the bottom, which is real unusual. It's called a subluxation erecti, and it's locked there out the, the bottom of the socket. As I'm walking off, my whole body is just, just numb. It's just, it's numb with shock. It wasn't really so much the pain, it was just knowing the reality of what this was. And even when the news came down, you know, how serious the injury was, I knew with his work ethic that Drew would bounce back. You know, the type of makeup, the character of Drew Brees, you thought if there was going to be a guy that was going to have some adversity in his life and be able to overcome it, you knew it would be him. And just took a deep breath and said, you know, one day at a time and, and let's see how severe this is. A few days later, I was contacted by Drew and his agents and he came to see me in, in Birmingham and I knew he was going to have to have it operated on. Dr. Andrews was known to be the, the guy to go to. And I remember him examining Drew, and when he was examining Drew's arm, he was kind of yanking his arm and pulling it up, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, he's going to do more damage, you know, because he was really kind of getting in there. I remember him looking at me and saying, basically, I've, I've never quite seen anything like this. I know that it's, it's serious. I know I can fix it. I just don't know exactly what I'm going to need to do quite yet, because I, I think once I get in there, I might find out some more. His main deal was that he wanted to know did he have to, did I have to cut to fix it? Or could I do it arthroscopically? And I think he was worried if I had to cut, make an incision, that he knew that that was a harder thing to come back from. And he was, of course, worried about his career. I knew I had torn a labrum pretty se severely, um, but there was rotator cuff damage too. We just didn't know the extent of it. So when I went under, I really didn't know the extent of what that surgery was going to be. We put the scope in and then we were able to truly identify all of the pathology. And he had a 360 degree labral tear all the way around his shoulder, particularly involving the bottom of his shoulder where the labrum attaches to the socket. The thing that we were a little bit surprised with was that he had a complete tear of the undersurface of his supraspinatus and infraspinatus, his rotator cuff and we had to repair all of that. Uh, I was paged in the middle of the surgery and I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, something's wrong, something's wrong. And Dr. Andrews just, just was on the phone with his sweet Southern accent just saying, Brittany, just want to let you know, everything's going great, everything's good. You know, and then just hung up and that was it. I'm still coming out of it, but I'm just, I'm down and he puts his hand on my shoulder and in true Dr. Andrews fashion, he said, if I did that surgery a hundred times, I couldn't, I couldn't do, it do it as good as I did it this time. And, I, and it kind of per perked up and I was like, really? And I wanted to plant that positive seed in his mind so that he knew that he could get well. That was, that, that helped me breathe a sigh of relief. And it was groggy and that was the first question. Did they have to cut? Did they have to cut? Did you have to cut? Said, did you have to cut? And he's like, no. He said, we were able to do it arthroscopically. arthroscopically. He said, how did it go? 
I told him. That was the most amount of anchors that I have ever put in anyone's shoulder in my entire life. He said you got 13 anchors in there, 11 in your uh, labrum and two in your rotator cuff. I don't, you know, where do you go from there? I don't even know what that means. It made it a lot better prognosis to be able to put all that back arthroscopically because it was less trauma and less injury for, by surgery to the shoulder joint. And then I knew, okay, it's all about the rehab. And I said, all right, what, what's the rehab look like? Eight months. It's like, whew, eight months. Even after Drew had had the surgery, the, the chargers were still saying to him, we're, we're still gonna take you back. We are still our guy. You know, you had that scenario that was a little misleading, and then you were kind of being pulled in a couple different directions. You know, I was going into an off season where I don't have a contract. They're just looking for an excuse to put Philip Rivers on the field. It was interesting because, you know, Drew had something to prove. You know, you had some people saying that he would never play football again, you know, and then you had some people saying that, look, he, he can come back from this. This is good. You know, we've, you've gotten all the results. You know, he's, he's back, his throwing speed, you know, everything's back, his arm strength's back, but, you know, he still had to prove himself. As much as I wanted to believe in my heart, you know, that I was going to come back and I was going to come back stronger, I mean, that was my mindset and my, you know, everything in my being was saying that. Still, there was reality. <laughs> I hope I can come back and do this. I'd say the best word to describe New Orleans in that sort of fall of 05 is uncertainty. I mean, definitely, I look at it from a Saints perspective. We didn't know exactly what was going to happen with the Saints. We didn't know if the Superdome would be back in time for them to have a, a season at home in 06. But, I mean, you, you didn't know what was going to come back and how long it was going to take. I, I, I think that uncertainty swept everybody in, in every aspect of this city. Everyone saw the flooding and the devastation and the big picture was really more about the region and the, and the town than it was just about Saints football. Well, it, it was difficult just because of the circumstances of the city and, but we, we got the right staff. We got a lot of good coaches. We had a good mix of veterans and, and young coaches and, and, um, you know, it's funny how the offseason goes. You talk about the NFL Combine and you talk about all the draft picks and they had the number two pick in the draft. So we focused a lot on which quarterback they liked. We were at the Combine focusing on Vince Young and Matt Leiner. And the last day of the Combine, I believe, we found out that um, San Diego had released Drew. And Drew Brees was one of these quarterbacks, even though he had the questions about the shoulder, he was obviously an established Pro Bowl quarterback. Those guys don't usually become free agents. So um, he was a huge curiosity and uh, it per made perfect sense for the Saints to kick the tires on him. Yeah. I'll forever remember the first phone call I got from Sean Payton because that was a huge boost for me. You know, I didn't know what free agency was going to look like for a guy with damaged goods, right? With, with you know, an eight-month rehabilitation process in front of him and doctors telling him he's got 25% chance of playing football again. We spent some time on the subject with the injury that he had. We were really concerned and, man, we had a lot of doctor's reports. You know, I'm sitting there going, how am I going to impress anybody right now, you know, um, other than just saying, hey, watch my film and look in my eye and, you know, I'll, I'm going to come back stronger than ever. We did a lot of due diligence on that, not just on the injury but on Drew himself and, and what we found was you know a young man who always defied the odds uh, to be successful. We knew it wasn't going to be a matter of, of lack of effort. He was going to do everything he could to get his shoulder where he could play again. And then Mickey and I actually went to Birmingham to pick he and Brittany up uh, on Mr. Benson's plane when it came to them coming on a visit. And I remember Sean just being such like a talkative, sweet kind of, you know, like in, in, you know, just excitable guy. Now knowing what I know is that coach was constantly trying to talk to us so we wouldn't look out the windows of the plane. Because, you know, we're, we're landing right there, you know, in the, 
where the airport is, and it was it was a hard hit area. I'm driving the car, and it's Drew in the front seat, Brittany in the back seat, and I'm driving like I've been a resident for 10 years, and I've only been here for a couple months. He's driving us all around. We went over to the North Shore to look at some housing. And we go over the causeway, you know, and it's the bump. You know, and so there's that point, I look in the rearview mirror, and I see, I see Brittany just kind of nodding off, you know. <laughs> well, well, I was exhausted. I have, to, I have to admit, I was exhausted at that time because we were kind of all over the place. And we get lost. And, and somewhere off the causeway, I ended up spun around, and I know I was heading, I was heading towards Baton Rouge. And He's starting to panic, so I start laughing because we are so lost. I'd say two of the hours were spent lost. One hour was spent looking at a few homes. In a really bad area. You know, there was not only devastation, but I mean, I don't even know if we're going to get out at this point. And I'm thinking, I might as well just like drive them to the airport and put them on the Miami Dolphins plane. You know, Coach always does what he does best, is he's, he's going to smooth it over, he's going to make it work, and everything's going to be fine. I called Mickey and he got us squared away. So we got him back to the hotel and fortunately uh, they hung in there. And it just came down to what Drew I think has said so many times, you know, New Orleans believed in him. You know, and you got that feeling like when we were here and I think even Sean said to, to Drew at one point is, listen, you need us just as much as we need you. you know, that was the season where the group of castaways had been signed by Mickey Loomis and Sean Payton to come to Hurricane Ravage, New Orleans and put together a team and see if we could go out and compete and win some games. Joe, what impact has, has Drew had on this team? Oh man, big time leadership. The day one when I met Drew, um, he was 150% he was downhill ready to go. Uh, wanted to be a leader. Then when he got on the football field, knowing he couldn't throw the ball, he was still involved. He was still trying to be the general, trying to be the leader. And, and, and I like that. Are, are you allowed to throw it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, allowed to throw it. I, I throw it, yeah, 80 throws is about what I'm at. And then, um, uh, you know, 55 yards probably at this point. And then gradually I'll just build it up through camp. I think, you know, I, I reached my limit um, as far as where I could go with rehab. Obviously, it was his first day out throwing uh, in a team setting. You know, we had to kind of battle through some things, and there's some things that look rusty. But overall, I thought uh, I thought he threw it around pretty well. well he was not 100% one bit as far as training camp was concerned, and I saw it because I wasn't 100% myself. And so a lot of days, you know, he may go out and practice, but the velocity was not there. The arm strength had not gotten back completely but he continued to rehab, he continued to strengthen it. I didn't have a sense in my mind of what Drew Brees should look like, uh, so it was hard for me to evaluate him in those early practices and training camp and OTAs and say uh, where he was at in his recovery. You know, if you recall in the spring, Drew didn't throw at all, and then he began throwing at training camp, but on a pitch count of, you know, 40 or 50 passes. So he wasn't 100% yet, and he didn't have the velocity or the timing down yet. At some point, he turned to offensive coordinator Pete Carmichael, uh, who had worked with Drew in San Diego, and said something to the effect of, "Is this is this is this it yet? <laughs> you know, is this is he 100%?" And, and Pete Carmichael apparently insisted, "No, no, no. There's more. There's more." And, uh, as a coach, there's probably a little anxiety as you're getting through training camp early on, a couple preseason games early, and maybe the ball is just not coming out as as well as you, you'd like. Uh, but again, the doctors just said, hey, process. You just got to trust it. We'll see. You can always talk about how much talent you got on your team. But uh, until that first snap on Sunday, when the, when the, real, when the real bullets start flying, we real, really start playing football teams across the league, you can't really tell. This team looked awful during the preseason. They got blown out in the preseason games. It looked sloppy. Uh, they had run these guys into the ground in training camp in Millsaps. It, it just expectations couldn't be lower for the Saints heading into that year. You know, there were stretches during that season or early in that process where we weren't sure if we were going to win a game. I remember we played Indianapolis and he had an interception in the game and the ball floated on him a little. But after the game, he came to me, he said there was a throw I made tonight that was a benchmark that I, that it felt like it's going to be just fine. And 
you know, he's optimistic, but he was serious about it. He, there was something he did in that game that he, he was very encouraged with that he hadn't felt or, or demonstrated prior to the injury. And I would say by that last preseason game, maybe first or second game, all of a sudden you're seeing some throws and... He's getting more reps. He's getting more reps, and obviously his, his arm um, is strong enough to throw the passes that uh, a lot of people didn't think he'd be, be able to throw right now. So We won at Cleveland. We won at Green Bay. We come back and win Monday night at Atlanta, and then we felt like, man, we can do this. And I'm sure they'll be uh, highlighting that a lot on ESPN tonight. <laughs> and really, I would say after the first two or three games, it, it really, the question just kind of disappeared. And Next question. The game that cemented it was at Dallas. It was Sean Payton against Bill Parcells, his mentor. The Cowboys were really good then, an established team. And not only did the Saints squeak one out, they rolled on the Dallas Cowboys in that game. You could tell he had like a special book that he had probably written up that summer for. When we play Bill Parcells in Dallas, I'm going to use this, this, and this. And I remember Peyton later saying they, they enjoyed that win so long that they asked the pilot to take like an extra long flight home from Dallas so they could all celebrate on the plane together. But that was the one. That was the one where they went from good story to, wow, one of the best teams in the NFC, no doubt about it. I think we overachieved quite a bit that year. What a matchup today on Fox. The winner, Super Bowl 41 in Miami. I'd bet if you asked Sean Payton if he could have one do-over in his entire career, it might be, it might be the, the playoff game in Chicago. Now, they might never have won that game anyway. The Chicago Bears were so good. They had a great defense on their side, and they had the weather on their side. It was kind of an icy, wet day. Look, enough improbable things happened in that 2006 season. I guess it was too much to ask for one more improbable victory. You know, that was probably riding on pure emotion and grit and determination and you know just the city behind us the bond that was being created I mean that was it was magical somewhere between 2006 and 2009 Breeze went from being a real good story and a, a good leader and an MVP type of guy because because of everything to oh wait a minute this guy is the next Dan Marino but going into 07 and 08 you know, with a seven and nine and an eight and eight season, I think we realized, all right, this is a little bit tougher than, you know, maybe we expected, anticipated. We felt like we're better than this. Our, our record doesn't indicate uh, the amount of talent we have in the room. But we have learned so much during that stretch. You learn more from failure than you do from success. We knew we had every single element that it took um, to be a championship organization, it was just a matter of putting in the work and, and then showing up on Sundays to handle business. Not only had we learned so much from 07 and 08, but the right pieces were in place. You know, we had made some trades and acquisitions and some drafts, draft classes that all of a sudden were starting to mature and come together and it was just beginning to boil. Like we were hitting that tipping point where all of a sudden we were going to come alive. It was exciting. I mean, we had a great group of guys, guys that we're so close to today the veteran players on both sides of the ball and the way that guys work for one another and cared about one another. And at off-season workouts, guys are finishing, guys are rooting for each other. We're competitive. We wanted to be the best. Everybody's flowing, nobody's complaining. It got fiery at times. They were going at it, offense versus defense in practices. You could have charged admission for those practices and people would have gotten their money's worth. We had our battles and you'd fight, but it was like fighting with your brother. The guys, the guys really loved coming to work to be with each other. We're acting like a family. And when you're family, you know, special things happen. From the very beginning, I think we felt like this was our year. Gosh, um, the Super Bowl season is um, its such a blur. I mean, it's such a blur. I just wish I could rewind and just watch the entire thing with a big bucket of popcorn and enjoy every aspect of it. The Saints were a freight train in 2009. They win the first game over the Lions by like, you know, 50 something to whatever, and they're winning games uh, left and right. Things were clicking for us. Things were going the right direction for us. Offense, defense, special teams, everything was clicking. I mean, yeah, I mean, once, once you win about seven or eight games in a row, you're like, okay, we're really good. Every season requires 
Those wins that build confidence, belief, momentum, and just that, you know, we can do it mentality. So I'll never forget the game where they're at Miami. 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 Miami was a, I mean, that was a battle. Where we go on the road, we're down 21 points. And they needed some turnovers and they needed Drew Brees to go for it on fourth down. And You know, he, he's bringing us back, he's bringing us back, and he obviously had the one where he Dive over, over the and goal line and uh, he ran one in and dunked Brees, over the goal post. The keeper takes it in as he has scored on the ground twice. Find a way offensively and defensively, play after play, just fight our way back. It showed how, our toughness. The Washington game where we go on the road, going there and knowing that we're in for an all-day sucker, you know, and they get up by a lot. And, and we throw an interception, Robert Meacham runs it down, strips the ball. I remember blocking for him to get, at least give him some room. <laughs> comes back, you come away with points off that, it is incredible, but you know, that that right there shows like, yo, that was toughness, like we, like no, yes, we messed up, we had, we got your back, Drew. End of the game, if they make a field goal, they basically ice it. Chip is on the way, and it is no good, he missed the chip shot with one yes. And we, you know, we find a way to get some pressure, they miss it, we go down, we score, overtime, we get it back, we kick and a field goal. Good. Let's go home, everybody, as 12-0 champions of the NFC South. We go running race. out of that locker room just like, uh, I don't know if we should have won that one, but. We can overcome any odds. We can beat anybody, anywhere, anytime. That was the moment that most of us were really on board with. We should win a Super Bowl, you know, just with the level that we were playing at. It, it became clear that this was a really special team. Regular season just puts you in a position for the playoffs. The playoffs is the prize. And then the grand prize is the Super Bowl. One of the best things about the Saints playoff run in 2009 is it was no fluke. Uh, so here's who Drew Brees beats uh, the other quarterbacks that he faces in the playoffs there. Kurt Warner, Hall of Famer, and the Arizona Cardinals come into the Superdome in the divisional round. No problem, they take care of them. Brett Favre, Hall of Famer, and the Minnesota Vikings come in in the NFC Championship game. A little bit of a tighter game. First of all, Minnesota was an unbelievable team. Half the Pro Bowl NFC team was Minnesota players. They were so talented. You gotta be kidding me, boys. It was kind of a test for us. How good is the Saints team? You know, can they beat the elite of the elite? So hard fought on both sides. I mean, everybody just pouring everything they had into that game. And, and then coming down to the very end where, you know, our defense, Tracy Porter, get the interception. It goes to OT, Pierre Thomas, a great return. Going for it on fourth down where this is make or break, right? This is the game. We get it, first down, puts us in field goal range, and then here comes Garrett Hartley. So you're lining up for the winning field goal in overtime to send the New Orleans Saints for the first time in organization history to the Super Bowl, and it all rides on this one play. Everybody was thinking this to make this field goal for the city. Don't make it for us. Don't make it for just me as an individual. Make this for the city. Make this for everyone. It's good! It's good! good! And he puts it right through the uprights and hits the full delay. Put it right down the middle. He was like, okay, here y'all go. <laughs> Not to mention you're in the Superdome and that place was going nuts. Like that feeling still gives me goosebumps to this day just thinking about it. And it was amazing. That ball goes through and then you realize we are going to Miami. We are going to the Super Bowl. Oh my God, the Saints are in the Super Bowl. <laughs> what a circus the entire Super Bowl week is. Amazing that they find time to jam a, a football game in the middle of this three ring circus of activity that they have. But you know, it, the Super Bowl is a night game. So these guys have all this, this time, you know, and they're kind of seating around and it's just like this weird, you know, limbo where you've got all this energy. You know, we, we were the newcomers. You know, we were the, the wide eyed, you know, walking in the stadium, having no idea what to expect. I was in a hotel room with the baby, and then my mom was there as well. And so Drew was like, can you come to my room and just watch a movie? Can we just watch a movie? I just need to calm down. And so my mom watched the baby, and I remember we just laid in bed and watched Major League. But it was, it was a crazy experience. On the flip side, here's the Indianapolis Colts, veteran team. They had just won a Super Bowl. 
four years previous at that exact spot. As an offensive tackle for an offense that throws the ball a lot against two of the best defense, defensive ends in the world, and Dwight Freeney and Robert Mathis, uh, you had some condor-sized butterflies at times, but... The biggest challenge for us is just going to be the start of this game and just... Takes that play, third down play, Manning's going to the end zone, and the ball is caught, touchdown Indianapolis! The Super Bowl couldn't have started any worse for the Saints. And sure enough, you know, they come out, bang, 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 they score 10 points, and it's 10-nothing. And one of the hidden things that really helped them was uh, Garrett Hartley, the kicker, makes two long field goals, both over 40 yards before halftime. Which was huge because all of a sudden you go from 10-0 to 10-6. It's a one possession game. And not only one possession, but you know, touchdown puts you in the lead. And that's when Coach Payton makes the, the call in the locker room at halftime that here comes ambush, you know, here comes the onside kick. Looking at uh, every time he comes off the field. Onside kick to start the second half. And the ball bounces off the hands of a Colt. And it looks like the Saints had it for a second. How about this way to start the second half? Well, you and the Saints football. They recover the onside kick. What a fearless start to the second half. Really unbelievable to see. At some point, Drew got really hot. He leads them on a touchdown drive to go ahead in this game, completing all eight of his pass attempts to eight different receivers. And it was just completion after completion after completion after completion. Uh, yeah, one to Colston, one to Reggie, one to Pierre, whatever it was on that drive, he, he hit everybody. Okay, wait a second. We're like, we're ahead now, okay? We're in Miami. We're playing in a Super Bowl against Peyton Manning and the Indianapolis Colts. And we're up by seven. You know, just taking it in. Uh, Tracy Porter cuts in front. He takes it back. He houses it for a touchdown. So we're up by 14 and we're going to win a Super Bowl. There were so many cameras and there were so many reporters and so many people that people were just pushing and shoving everywhere. And I ended up giving Drew the baby, Balin, because I was kind of worried for Balin. And Drew was up, you know, on the podium with the, with the stairs right there. And so I was like, love, just take, just take the baby. And so it was more kind of like a safety thing because you're just getting like pushed around and... There's no question that image of Drew Brees holding up his son under the confetti. It's a lasting image in New Orleans. I think it's a, a lasting image in the sport. I mean, it's too, they probably should have trademarked the baby wearing the earphones. That, that's their thing forever. That's Balin Brees right there. I, it was my idea for the earphones. It was funny, um, our good friends are Adrian and Nina Young. And so Adrian Young is a drummer for No Doubt. So they have kids, and I remember us talking about, you know, what do I do with the noise? Because that's what you love about the dome. It is so loud, you know? And there's times I walk away from a headache, you know, a game with a headache. And so she was saying, when we go and watch Adrian play, I put, you know, these earphones on the baby. So I can't take credit for that at all. We, we think about the Super Bowl moment, uh, you know, often how that was a moment that I dreamed about, you know, as uh, ever since I entered this league is, I hope I can win a championship, and when I do, I hope that I have, you know, my child to share that with, and it's just awesome. Let's head down to the field. Here's Lisa Salters. What has been the coolest part of the week so far for you? Um, meeting Marshawn Lattimore, Antonio Brown, and Jarvis Landry. This is exactly what you told me earlier. Hands to yourselves, guys. They fight constantly, right? <laughs> Pretty much, All right, we lost them. We lost them. I have completely lost control. When I was pregnant with Balin and we found out it was a boy, I remember his grandma coming up to me saying, well, good luck, because Drew and his brother used to try and walk on my walls. They were crazy. And I was thinking, well, that's a strange thing to say. You know, and sure enough, she was right. The, I don't know what it is about their genetics, but they're crazy. I can't control them. I literally can't control them. And then Drew comes home and he riles them up again. You know, like I will just have fed them and bathed them and like I feel like it's calm. And then he'll walk in the door and be like, who wants to throw the football? Who, who wants to tackle daddy? Who wants, you know, to do this? And I find myself like, okay, get off daddy. Like he needs, cause Drew will never say he's sore. He'll never like say, daddy needs to sit down. Like he is just not that person. He, that's not in his DNA. So 
I find myself like I have to be the bad guy. Like you cannot jump on daddy's back like that. You cannot sweep his legs. Like you guys are getting bigger. You're going to hurt him at some point, you know? So, but he, that's just the kind of daddy is. Yeah, there's, there's lots of funny stories about when I was trying to court my wife, uh, Brittany at Purdue. I guess the, the first one and, and maybe one of the most legendary is it was my 19th birthday. Um, so it was in January, season's over. It's kind of our off time um, as a football team prior to starting winter conditioning and then into spring training. And so I'm with a group of guys and, and we're kind of at a house party and we're, we're having a good time. We're kind of out in the parking lot. The snow was probably maybe this high off the ground. There's like 10 feet of snow around us, but we don't care. We're just having a good time. I was there with a friend um, at an apartment complex and Jason and Drew came in and I remember Jason's hands were bloody because they were wrestling out in the snow. And that was my first introduction to my sweet husband. You know, here walks this, this girl, um, you know, right, right by me and I, I immediately look at her and I look at them and I say, I'm gonna marry that girl. And I go kind of ch chasing her into, into the house and try to start up a conversation. But, you know, it's my 19th birthday and it basically made a fool of myself in front of her. I probably gave her every, every cheesy pickup line you possibly could um, to try to impress her. And, and obviously it was not doing that. In fact, she thought I was just a kind of a, a football jerk. I thought he was a typical crazy football player and didn't have a lot of interest in him at the time. I remember Drew coming home telling me that he met this young lady named Brittany. I could see that, that you know, Drew definitely had a little sparkle in his eye. So then, late fast forward, and we're into the summer, and we meet again. At one point, I kind of go over and strike up a conversation. I can tell she's remembering the first time we met and really wanting to exit this conversation however she can, yet she can't find anybody to come save her, right? And so um, we're talking and then there's a group that's going back to um, kind of an apartment complex that you know a lot of the, the players and, and people uh, on campus stayed. And so they were making their, their way back there and, and everybody was claiming they couldn't drive because um, they had had too much to drink. So I, I, I hadn't had anything to drink. So I said, you know what, I'll, I'll drive. I'll, 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 uh, I'll drive everybody. And he has convinced me that he doesn't have a ride to this next party that we're all going to. He's used every now excuse that he needs to drive my car. And I finally explained, it's a stick shift. You probably can't drive a stick shift. And of course he says, I can totally drive a stick shift. I, I've driven a stick shift before, this is great. I've never driven a stick in my life. Needless to say, he had never driven a stick shift in his entire life. I'm totally just troubleshooting this as we go along. I only stalled twice. You know, it was about, you know, I don't know, six or seven miles away. Only stalled twice. One was on a big hill at a stop sign in my defense. I spent the entire probably 10 minutes laughing hysterically because we were just jerking back and forth and back and forth. So I thought I was pretty successful, but we got, everyone got there safely. And that, that, was, that, was, that was all that mattered. And um, I think maybe just the fact that I was trying so hard to impress her and make her see that I was a decent guy and to give me a chance, I think that that, that won her over to a degree. We went back to this, this party and um, we ended up spending all night talking, just staying up and talking. And we had the most similar views on everything. It was crazy. I mean, we wanted to name our children the same names. We had the same religious background. We had, you know, the same ideas of where we wanted to go in life. And um, at that moment, I think we just both knew. Like it was, it just clicked. And it was almost scary, you know, just that overwhelming feeling of, okay, is this it? Like, is this, is this how it happens? Like, this is, this is it? He did not call. He did not call me the next day. And I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to transfer because I just drove a football player back in my car at seven o'clock in the morning and he's never gonna speak to me again. And I thought he was the one. And sure enough, we went out that night. And of course he was like, I, I lost your number. Da -da 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 -da, you know, one of those things. And, um, and we were inseparable ever since. The rest is history. Brit is Brittany is the epitome 
of multitasking. <laughs> like you can only imagine with four kids and you know times where I I'm here at the facility and I'm watching film and you know I know I'm kind of you know I'm on my way home and I'll give her a call or a FaceTime and here she is and it's it's I'm setting the phone down to talk to you but I'm here making spaghetti and it's you know Rylan get off the table and it's boys you know quit throwing the ball up against the cabinets and get over here and Callan get the you know the uh, silverware on the on the table and bow and get the milks for everybody and you know it's just like um, it's amazing how she's able to manage all these things and do it in such a loving a loving way I love watching her love our kids um, you know each one of them she's she's such a great um, uh, she can read people and read emotions really really well and it's amazing to see the different personality traits in your kids and the way that she is able to handle each one of them based upon those personalities and based upon the way that they would best respond is, is, a, is a gift and she's got it. You know, it's, it <laughs> is amazing that they are at the age where they, they get it. They understand what daddy does, but in that same aspect, I feel like we're so blessed because there are so many valuable teaching fundamental lessons here, right? Of, of humanity and, and charity and kindness and losing with grace and, you know, being, um, being a good sport about things, you know, that there are so many things that I think we're able to teach them and that hopefully they listen. My favorite thing is hey, just sitting back and watching my kids play, honestly. I love, I love sports. I've loved sports since I was a kid. I love playing it, I love watching it. It's been such a huge part of my life. Um, I've always hoped that my kids would love it as much as I do. It seems like they do, <laughs> which is great because these are things we can do together and I feel like I can impart you know, wisdom and, and uh, advice and, and, and teach them you know, the things that I learned when I was a kid from my dad, from my granddad, from my coaches. And, um, but just to sit and watch them just go and be creative and uh, those are those are my happiest moments as a dad if Britt and I can just sit there and hold hands and watch our kids play it's the greatest it's another thing you see on TV and you see in commercials is Drew Brees with his kids but if you see him when the cameras aren't on and you're just around the facility all the time it's Drew Brees with his kids uh, I've also had to uh, the chance to go out and do a story with him coaching his sons in, in the flag football league that he started in New Orleans. So uh, uh, every every bit of everything that, that Drew and Brittany did as a young couple who wanted to embrace in New Orleans, now they're a growing family that has embraced everything about New Orleans. You know, I don't even know if I could put it into words um, what New Orleans and the city has meant to us. I mean, they embraced us at a time where, you know, we were still so young. And I, and I think that because we are here, they have shaped us in such a way that we are better people, you know? And I think there's such a love um, and kindness and, and hospitality, you know? And there's, I mean, the New Orleans people, it, it's amazing because they really make you better, you know? And they remind you like, Life's, life is good. You know, there's a lot of things that could be, that could you, you could focus on that could be going you know badly, but I feel like as a whole, New Orleans has really shaped us to be better people, you know, more loving, kinder, and I mean, I had all my babies here, you know, like this is this is truly truly our home. I love it. I have a coach's Bible study on Tuesday mornings, and we were talking. I, I mentioned that you guys were coming from New Orleans, and I said. I said, can you believe that? He's going to set the NFL passing record. I can remember when he couldn't do a pull-up, you know, when he was in the eighth or ninth grade. It's, it's an unbelievable story for people that know Drew, but they all just smile because he was just such a great kid. That's the first thing people will say about him. He is a great kid. Not only was he gifted 
and talented to be one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game. But he's one of the most positive influences on the, on the city of New Orleans post-Katrina, on the communities that he's been in, and on so many lives. I, I can't even begin on a personal level the times that I've seen him go out of his way to change somebody's world. I asked him for a favor kind of out of the blue on behalf of a, a friend whose, whose kid was going through some, some stuff. So somebody eight levels removed from Drew. And I shot him a text out of the blue saying, hey, it would mean a lot. Um, no, you're totally busy. You could just say hi to this. And within 30 minutes, I get a text back saying, absolutely, I'll handle it. He's sending an incredibly heartfelt couple minute message to this kid who idolizes him. He doesn't know this kid from Adam. I don't really even know the kid. It's not my kid. It's just something that he does. He appreciates and understands his role as a role model, but a lot of people say that. He does that, right? And if he's doing that for me, somebody that he sees maybe once a year and texts with a handful of times a year, he's doing that all over the place. He is a team builder, and, and it's been that way since, you know, we, we put the pads on in, in 1993. Drew's not the guy, he's not the me guy. You know, he's a we guy. And he had, Drew had every right to be cocky. He had every right to think he was better than a lot of the guys on our team, myself included. Um, but you will never see that. And, and so I think what happens is that when the guy at the top, who's supposed to be the man, is more concerned about bringing everybody else around and along for the ride, um, I think that's where Drew got most of his happiness in playing you know, football with us, is, is, is the, the relationships you build. What's that, man? Tonight, it's about us! It's about us! It's about our strength, our love, our compete, our passion! Our togetherness! That's what tonight's about! Let's go get this win for each other! Let's go! Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. circle the date the moment the schedule came out you could have done the math and now you'll listen to the roar ball spotted at the saints 38 yard line first and 10 246 remaining saints lead it 20 to 6. breeze has completed passes to eight different receivers already he starts in the shotgun drops back looks to the far sideline wide open Traquan smith and Traquan Smith is going to go to the end zone. Drew Brees has done it. You have just witnessed history in New Orleans. Drew Brees is the NFL's all-time leading passer. What a way to do it. There's only one word that comes to mind. Greatness. Right there, right now, that moment. There is the ball, and that ball is going to be headed to Canton, Ohio. The white gloves are on the Hall of Fame president, David Baker. Hey, boys! How about that, huh? How about that? Hey, I love you guys so much. Hey, you're going to accomplish the only thing in life you're going to work for, right? I love you, boys. I love you. Soak it in, Drew. Well earned. And to think that he does it here at home on a Monday night. In front of these fans, and in this city. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Thank you, coach. 
Come on, let's go win the game. All right, come on. Could it have happened any better way? Drew Brees with a 62-yard passing strike to Traquan Smith, and he is now the NFL's all-time leading passer. So the lights outside, they're going to be black and gold. It's been pink outside. It will be black and gold for the next nine minutes, and man, that's special. His boys are down there on the sideline, and it's, you had the whole team. Everybody goes out in the middle of the field, and they congratulate him. You know, I don't know how all this time went by. Like, I, I look back at all of these years, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like how, you know, how did this fly by, you know? How, how have all these years gone by? And, and so, gosh, when we think about him retiring, I feel like it's almost like a bad word, you know? Like, it's just, I mean, he loves it. And why would you, why would you stop something that you love, you know? And there's nothing better than doing something that you love every single day of your life. Drew is hyper-focused at whatever it is that he does, and when he sets his mind on something, you know, Drew's going to complete it. He's, he's going to get it done. The intensity that everybody sees from Drew all the time is constant, and by intense, I mean very competitive. So the leadership was, no matter if it was just a seven-on-seven -seven drill or if it was a nine-on-seven drill, um, he always wanted to win, and everybody else took the lead and followed suit. So he's a guy who's determined to be the best and work on his game and studies it nonstop. He was a true leader. Um, he showed you by example how to work hard. He was very hard on himself. He was determined to be the best and wanted to be best and wanted to be great, which is good. And he knew how to have fun too doing it. still playing this game. All right, this is a special moment. I'll remember this forever. But I came back for one reason. And you guys know what that is. Mm -hmm. So let's keep taking steps one at a time, man. Because I got my sights, you have your set sights, we have our sights set on something even greater. Mm -hmm. All right, Louisiana is known for three things, their food, their music, the saints, and the birthplace of me, Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> that was four things, but who's counting? Uh, I wanted to, here's what I want to do. I want to say congratulations to my friend Drew Brees on beating the record for passing, which I thought I had the record for passing, because I pass on everything. Every, I mean everything. Would you help me move? Pass. Would you, would you speak at my nephew's bar mitzvah? Pass. <laughs> would you please pull over, ma'am? Pass. You know, seriously, I pass on everything, except when I heard this was for you, my friend. I will not pass on that. Congratulations, Drew. I love you so very much. And you know I'd do anything for you, unless you need a ride to the airport, and then hard pass. <laughs> Drew, what's going on? Mr. Breezy, it's been a pleasure to be here with you. Congratulations on breaking the record. Congratulations, man. I mean, all time leading career passer. Uh, you deserve it. Das Breezington, what's up, buddy? <laughs> Favorite backup here. Just wanted to say congratulations on being the NFL's passing king. I want to wish you congratulations on becoming the NFL's passing king. Congratulations, Drew. Drew, congratulations on becoming the all-time passing leader in the NFL. You're the man. Drew, congratulations. Oh, man. Proud to know you, buddy. Congrats on the record, Drew. What a guy. Drew, <laughs> you did it. 
Congrats on breaking the NFL's career passing record. We're so proud of you. Oh my God. You're the best. Oh man, that was special. There's just so many people that, that have a hand in this. Um, so many people that have been, been uh, a part of this journey and uh, it just makes me think of all those people. I think it would take, it would probably take almost a year to, to reach out to every single person that um, I feel has had a hand in this. There's just, there's just so many. It just makes me so proud. Um, I hope that they're proud. I hope that they have a great sense of pride feeling that, that they are indeed uh, a part of this and have had a hand in this. I have, yes. Honestly, my favorite part of, of watching all the, the nine for nines is watching them with my kids. The, the, the funniest part is the fact that, you know, Balin was around for the Super Bowl, right? Um, and he was the only one. And so I think the other three feel like they want a moment like that, you know, and, and I hope that you know, Monday night was, was one of those moments for them, but that uh, we'll be able to give them some even more special moments in the future.